in Colossians is another one of the prison epistles, you know, that, 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 that Paul wrote while he was in prison. Around This was around uh, 62 A.D. Uh, and he was in Rome. The other three that he wrote from prison were Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Now, Paul did not plant this church in uh, Colossae, Colossae, however it's said. It's about 100 miles from Ephesus. In, in today's uh, area, it would be in Turkey. You know, if you know where Turkey is, that, that's where it would be. And it was written to them to teach them about Jesus. Where Philippians was a book of joy, this Colossians is more doctrine oriented. Philippians was full of joy, you know, it was a great, great book. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So in this letter we see the majesty, we see the all-sufficiency of our Lord. It's how wonderful and great he is. And it builds you and I up in Christ. It builds us up in the Lord. To know him more, to walk with him closer. It's great. Now, at this time, you know, there was heresies in the church, you know, unsound doctrine, teachings of all different sorts that had been springing up. And one of them was Gnosticism. The Gnostics had, had a, they had this mystical understanding of Jesus. They believed that he was less than God. They believed also that he was not quite human either. You know, they, they had these beliefs like this. And it was combined with legalism, where you would earn your standard with the Lord. You work your way to the Lord, with, you know, to the Lord. Things that you did would save you. So there was teachings like that going on. You know, the word Gnostic means to know, to have knowledge. And they were people who were in the know and thought that they were better than other people because, you know, they knew. So that was their, their spiritual pride that they had. They were better than others. They knew more than others. You know, and... and Paul responds to this in different verses, and you know, look at verse, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created, both in heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And then in Colossians 2, 9, it says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He was God himself in the bodily form. But he was also a man. And he, in his bodily form, he declared and he showed them who God was. He was completely God. And he was also completely man. And he was set apart from the law that they had. In Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath day, things which are mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Don't let anybody judge you by the clothes you wear, what you eat, or you know, things like that. You know, is, Jesus is bigger than that. And so this book of letter, Colossians, gives us a practical application of the truth and how to walk with the Lord. An outline of a Christian life. What it is to be a Christian. And it's centered around Jesus Christ. So, let's read, starting at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. 
we'll just stop right there and go over those verses. Verse one and two there. He starts off with his introduction, his, his pretty common introduction. He lets them know that one number one that he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had seen Jesus. Remember when he met him on the road? He had seen Jesus. So he, he is an apostle by the will of God. And he calls them saints. Because they are believers in Jesus Christ. Saints. Saints. A holy one. Saint. Sanctified. Set apart. You know, that is you and I. We are set apart. Every one of us, when we believe in Jesus, we became, we are a saint. We are set apart for his use. And we are holy to the Lord. That's what set apart means. It means holy. That doesn't mean, saint doesn't mean super Christian. You know, because that's what we think of it. You know, we think somebody's a saint like, whoa. <laughs> saint James. <laughs> you know, no. It's not super Christian. It's just who we are. We're set apart for him or his. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 Speaking to the church, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. Those who have been set apart, sanctified by Jesus Christ, saints by calling, with all who are in every place, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So speaking to us all through time, everyone who is a born in a Christian, you are a saint. Okay? And you look at Corinth, you know, when it says there in Corinth that they were sanctified and set apart. Well, Corinth was a church that had a lot of sin in it. When you read the book, you know, I mean, he's really correcting them, rebuking them in that letter. And he calls them saints. So there goes, you know, the throw that thought out that they were, you know, these great, wonderful, perfect people. Only because of Jesus. And he, he greets them. He says, grace to you and peace from the Father in verse 2 of Colossians chapter 1. Grace to you. And when he says that, and, and you know, we can take this letter for ourselves, who is also written to us. Grace to you, to us. That mean, what does that mean? It means we have God's favor in our life. His unmerited favor. It's something we don't deserve, but he pours his grace out. Great. Gives us grace. And along with grace, when you have grace, you understand grace, you have peace. Because you know you're living in God's grace and his mercy. And that brings peace in your life. Because you know that you are right before God because of what Jesus has done for us. This is what I know kept Paul going. He knew God's grace and His mercy. Kept him going. He lived in it all the time. And in verse 3, then he says, We give thanks to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. You see, Paul understood prayer. And he was always praying for them. Praying for everybody that he would come in contact. Praying for them. He doesn't even know these people. He's praying for them. It's a valuable gift to God, to the body of Christ. Prayer. It's a gift. It's also a spiritual weapon for warfare. It's one of the part of the armor he gives us. And we can pray. Powerful tool. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Jesus was always getting alone to pray to the Father. You go late at night, go early in the morning, you go in, you leave the disciples and you stay here and wait. I'm gonna go pray. And he's always praying, he prayed, he prayed. As an example to you and I. You know, in Acts, in the book of Acts, the ministry, you know, the church has been born, the church is going, people are, are hanging together, you know, and there's all these ministry needs that are going on, and those apostles and those who were, you know, the leaders of the church, they were spending all their time ministering to the needs of the people and, and so they weren't spending time studying God's word and they weren't spending time in prayer, in, in prayer which was much needed and so they got the people together and they said hey listen let's pick up some God, some people you know seven who are filled with the spirit and you know, these qualifications for these guys to be deacons who can take care of the everyday business and the things that are going on and the widows and you know, all the needs are going on so that we can spend time in God's Word and in prayer. Acts chapter, chapter 6, verse 3. Here's how it's spoken and said. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, 
whom we may put in charge of this task, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. My prayer is that we would understand how important prayer is for us. I mean, I pray that you pray for me. I pray for you. I pray that you pray for one another that we pray. Because God listens. God, God answers prayer. Just think about it. You are talking to the creator of the universe when you pray. You're talking to God himself. And guess what? He's listening to little old you and me. He listens. He cares. He's interested. And not only that, he answers. Yes, no, or wait. But, you know, he answers. Creator of the universe. And like Paul, Paul had never been to this city. He had never been there. But he was praying for them. Didn't even know them. He was praying for them. Think about that. Well, why should I pray for them? I don't even know. You, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I constantly am praying. You know, one of my one of our lifelines for our connection back to the States is, is Facebook. You know, a lot of people hate Facebook for this reason. That reason. But for, for Anne and I, it's a lifeline to the States and a connection to people we know and a prayer lifeline because I see on there all the prayer needs that people have. The people in this village, when I see something happens, you know, our our, our pastor friend over in, in, in Independence, his mother died yesterday, you know, and so I see that, I pray for him. I didn't know her. And I, I see people have needs, you know, oh, my sister just went to the hospital. I pray for her. I don't know her. And you know what? And God listens. He doesn't care, you know, you know he, he's listening. He answers those prayers. We all need prayer. Every one of us. And for us to remember that and to pray. Unceasingly, the Bible says. You know, you're walking down the road, you know, doing your exercise, whatever you're doing, you know. I mean, what are you thinking about? Lunch, dinner? I mean, you think about praying. You can pray for somebody, you know. But you're going to watch a TV later, later Super Bowl next year. I don't know. You know, you can, you can spend, we can spend a lot more time praying when we're doing things. I don't, I, I seem to be talking to God all the time, you know. When Anna just come down to church doing stuff, I'm, I, I can't, I'm always talking to the Lord about everything. He's the only one around. <laughs> I'm in my house. There's God in me, you know. There's Jesus. There we are. <laughs> Pray unceasingly. So, he understood that. So then in, in verse 4 in Colossians, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. You see, he, he gets this good report about them. He hears about them. He hears about their faith in the Lord. He hears about their hope in heaven. You know, our, you know we have a hope. Our hope is, we're going to be in heaven. And it's not, I hope I'm going to be there. No, the hope is, I'm going to be there. That's my hope. I can't wait for that day. And then loving the brethren, these things that these people are doing in their lives. You know, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, But now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, and, and that's the love chapter. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, to have love, faith, and hope. It's important for our walks in the Lord. So he, he's saying, saying to them, you know, I've heard of you guys, I've heard of the, of the good things that you do and heard and then verse 5 there at the end it says of which you previously heard in the word of truth the gospel so they had been learning about Jesus they, they had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ you know the gospel means good news Jesus came to the earth he went to the cross and shed his blood for the sin of mankind and he rose from the dead if we put our faith and our trust in that fact we're saved. That's the gospel. That's good news. Because there's nothing else that you need to do but believe in that. And then hopefully, when you really do that, your life changes, you know, and you go on to serve the Lord. But serving the Lord doesn't save you. It's your faith in Him that saves you. It's what He did, not what you do. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And these guys at Colossae, they did understand that. And then verse 6 is, which has come to you just 
is in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God. So the gospel had been going out in, at that time in that known world. It had been gone everywhere. The gospel has been being spread. Spread everywhere. In verse 23 of this chapter, it says, If indeed you continue in the faith firmly, and firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So the gospel had moved fast throughout the world. I mean, people were hearing about it everywhere, about this Jesus and what he had done. But not all people were saved. People are here, but it doesn't mean that they get saved. We do not convert anyone. We can share the gospel, the good news. But we don't convert anybody. That's the Lord's work, and that's between them and the Lord. Whether they respond to it in a positive way or not, that's, that's up to them. But we know that as we do share it, we will see fruit. There will be fruit. You'll see it. Be fruit in your life, for one thing. And then, in verse 7 and 8 of Colossians, it says, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, I can't say that guy's name, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of you, your love in the Spirit. So this Epaphras could be Epaphrodites in Philippians. The same. I think it's the same guy. And I, I see this guy, he's kind of like, he, he does things for Paul, and he goes to the different cities and delivers the letters to the people, and then he brings back to Paul and tells him, hey, here's what's going on there. These people really love the Lord, you know, and he, he, he shares the things that are going on. And I love it. It is positive stuff when he shares with them. Because he tells them good things about what they're doing. Positive things. Good reports to Paul about them. And what does Paul do? Paul builds him up. He builds him up. And isn't that the way it is to be for you and I as the body of Christ? That we are here to build one another up, to lift one another up, and not to tear each other down. And unfortunately, as Christians, we see you know, us Christians backbiting, fighting, putting each other down. And we should be lifting one another up and not gossiping and doing things like that. But to build one another. We see it here as an example. I'm sure that Paul knew his faults. And I'm sure that he knew the faults of the people when he came to these different cities. And you know, and, and you, some of you know my faults, and Anna knows my faults, and you know what? But let's build one another up, because we all have faults. We're all sinners. We all stumble and fall. We know. My pastor and I, you know, we're, we're in the ministry together for all those years. Like 41 years ago, I met him. You know, and I, I, I was on staff with him for many, many years. You know what? He knew my faults. And I knew his faults. And we love each other still. And he didn't fire me because of my faults, and I didn't quit because of his faults. We just serve the Lord together and realize that we got faults. And we work on them, hopefully. So now, after Paul says this in verse 9 again, what he's going to do is he's going to pray for them. So in verse 9, and pray for us. I mean, we see this as a prayer. We see this as a prayer for you when he says this. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You know, there is power in intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer, you know, some of you heard that, hey, uh, you know, they're, they're an intercessory prayer. Well, that just means you're praying for somebody. You're interceding for them on behalf of them. Somebody goes in the hospital and they have had a heart attack or something happens to them. And you start praying for them. You're interceding for them. You know, before God, Lord, touch them, heal them. Let them know you. Use this for your glory. You know, you intercede for them. And that's what Paul's doing. He's praying for us. He's praying for them. <laughs> Number one, he's praying that they will know the will of God. Number one, that they will know the will of God. That is very, very important, that you and I know the will of God for our lives. I think it's probably one of the most important things in our life. 
I don't know what God's will is in my life. I don't know. You know, ask Him. Seek Him. He will show you. I mean, you can see in the Word very clearly. I mean, when He says, go into all the world and share the gospel. That's the will for God in your life, right? I mean, that's just one little thing. There's a little box. Just ask. Look. Seek. He will show you. And then He'll specifically show you things maybe that you should do. Like become a missionary in Russia or something, you know? He'll, he'll show you. He sure shows me. And he prays that this to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Not just practical and physical things, but spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom in your life. So you can understand. And to know God's way in our life, to understand spiritual things. Because the thing, I, 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 I've shared many times, everything is spiritual. Something's going on in the spirit, whatever, whatever happens. And so to understand those things. You know, the Gnostics back then would make you feel like they were the ones who had the truth. And the truth they had was false. And so now Paul's saying, I'm praying that you get spiritual understanding, the truth in your life. It's, there is a lot out there right now. There's a lot of stuff out there. It is spiritual false truth. It's, it's false truth. There's many. There's cults out there that say the name of Jesus and they don't even know who Jesus is. They, they serve a different Jesus. Just because they say the name of Jesus, they say the name of God, doesn't mean they are of God. So that you have that spiritual understanding, discernment, to know the difference. I mean, if you go to a church that says Jesus is not God, why are you there? Get out. Because my Bible is very clear. Jesus is God. And if God gives you that spiritual understanding, you go. We have a few of those around here. That's also to know our culture and know God's will. Because sometimes our culture and traditions don't line up with God's will also. And so we have to discern that also. Does this glorify God? Is this, you know, right before God, these things? But we've done it all our life. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our culture. That doesn't mean God's in it. Could very well be the devil in it. And a lot of times is. So, verse 10, let's continue with that prayer. After the wisdom and understanding, it says, so that you will you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. See, if you have the spiritual wisdom and you have the spiritual understanding, you are able to walk and glorify the Lord in your life. If you don't understand God's way, then, you, then you, you, we aren't going to do that. We're not going to glorify Him. We're not going to be pleasing to Him as we do the things in the world because we have not given them up or because everybody does it. But then we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that doesn't mean perfection. Because if it meant that, well, I'm disqualified. As we all are. Just following the Lord. Wanting to do the right thing for the Lord. Pleasing to God. Listen. Pleasing to God not pleasing to people. Many of us spend our time wanting to make people happy. Yeah, you know, we all do that. Because we want, we want to be liked. So sometimes we maybe compromise a little bit here and there because you know, we don't want that person to think badly of us. So we maybe will compromise a little bit here and there. Be careful of those things. Because that, that doesn't please the Lord when we're pleasing people and it's goes against what, what He desires of our lives. And we do this, if we have spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding, then we walk in a way worthy of the Lord, walking in the Spirit, then we'll, we will be bearing fruit in the things that we do. That, that's what it says. Bearing fruit in every good work. We will bear fruit in the things that we do as we walk with Jesus. And a lot of it, you know, just has to do, you have, you have a heart to want to do that, I mean, that, that's where it starts. You know, I've been many times my prayers, and Lord, I'm so... I, I remember when I when I got sick of the world. I had not been walking with the Lord, but I was a Christian. And I, you know what, Lord? I am sick of my life in the world. I want you. 
I want to know you. I want to serve you. I want to, I want you. You know what? I started reading the Bible. And you know what? My life started changing. And, 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 and the things I started doing were more pleasing to the Lord. And they, they would glorify the Lord. The, the, and I didn't become perfect. It just, it was the heart, I believe. It just starts with the heart. Maybe you're sitting there going, you know, my life is not reflecting the Lord. It's just not been that good. Well, you know what? Neither was mine. And I said, help, Lord. Help me, Lord. And he does. He will help you. And you do that, you're bearing spiritual fruit. And guess what? It says at the, the end there of verse 10, it says, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Oh, that's kind of where it starts. You know the will of God, the spiritual things? Well, and you will increase in the knowledge of God as you walk with Him and you serve Him and, and you get spiritual understanding with Him because you'll know Him more. And you'll know Him more. I mean, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this Bible here now. 41 years I've been studying this Bible. 41 years. So I know a little bit more than I did 41 years ago. Not much, but a little bit. I have a little more bit of understanding. I know who Jesus is. I know that I'm going to heaven. That's the main thing for me. I'm going to heaven. I just want everybody to go with me. And so does the Lord. God does not want any. He, is one of, he doesn't want anybody to suffer. He doesn't want anybody. But it's man's choice. They, they, they choose the Lord. You don't want the Lord? Well, then you don't get him. That's what it's at. You will know him more. Have more understanding of him. If you do it, know God's will for your life. You won't be stagnant. You won't be sitting on the shelf. You'll find God using you in ways you'd be amazed. That doesn't mean you're going to go stand on the corner, you know, go knocking on doors. But people will see you and they'll know. And God will use you. He likes to do that. And you're not doing it alone. Listen, in John 14, 26, Jesus said to his disciples, he says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring your remembrance, bring your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit, God Himself, by the Holy Spirit, comes and lives in you and gives you understanding and helps you learn and teaches you. Jesus said He'd send, and He did. He's here today. He lives inside of us, leads us, and guides us. So if you don't have understanding, He will help you have that understanding. You know, a lot of times, many people, we spend a lot of time in prayer for stuff. Lord, I want a new Lexus. Well, I haven't got one yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, we just pray, that's just, you know, we just pray for stuff, you know. Well, start to pray for God's will in your life. Let Him deal with the stuff. But, you know, we spend more, I don't know, we spend a lot more time praying about things. When we can pray, God, God's will. Spiritual understanding, those things, pray for it. And you know what? He will give you those things. Because he says he wants you to have them. He says, anything you pray in my name is my will. I'm going to give to you. Now, if I pray for Lexus, I'm probably not going to get it. You know, like when I prayed for a million dollars before, I didn't get it. You know, no tree grew in my backyard with dollar bills coming off it. It didn't happen. You know? I knew I wasn't going to get when I prayed it, but I said, well, you know, Lord, I don't have it because I don't ask for it. Well, I'm going to ask for it, but I know I'm probably going to get it because it's not your will probably, and I'll probably spend it on myself in the house. But anyhow, I'll pray for it. <laughs> and I didn't get it. But when I pray for spiritual things, I get them. I get them. When I pray this morning, when I pray yesterday, and I pray this week, that Lord, when I stand before your people, I pray to get something out of this today. And I believe you're going to get something out of it because that's his will. Just got to get me out of the way and hear his word, you know? Amen. I pray that you guys would get something and be a little bit more conformed in the image of Jesus. That you would be changed. That you have a desire to be in his word. That, you know, I, I, that, that's been my prayer all week. So you open up his word. You read it. You depend on the Holy Spirit to speak it to you. And you will get these things in your life that we're talking about. In verse 11 now, it says, <clears throat> Continue on, it says, in the end of verse 10, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. 
for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously. Wow. Then you get spiritual strength with all power. <clears throat> Why? To overcome the resistance that comes against you in this life. Because things come against you. You know, the world comes against you. Your flesh comes against you. And the devil and his buddies, they come against you. you got, you got three things working against you. But you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you have Jesus, which overcomes all of those things. When you submit to him, when you walk with him, when you do these things that it says to do, you'll overcome. You'll have a strength with all power according to his glorious might. Not your might, not the strength that you think you can have, but his might. And he's got all power. Anybody that can say, let there be light, and there's light, is powerful, okay, in my book. Anybody says, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes out walking out of the gate. Great. That's power. Anybody that comes out of the grave himself, Jesus, that's power. That's when he wants to strengthen you with his power. Wow. For attaining all steadfastness and patience. And you, and, and you don't get the power so you know you can be. Look at me. Be healed in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Wham! You know? <laughs> no. So you can be patient and steadfastness, you know? Have endurance with joy. You know, that, that's power. When you have patience with joy, that's power. That's some kind of, that's a, that's, that's a strength that not most of us have in the flesh. Patience with joy. Usually the patience comes with, what a proper Lord, oh my Lord, I don't know. I know. But, all right, Lord, you have, you have, it's, this happened for a reason, I'm here for a reason. I mean, how many times have you been in a line somewhere, it just, it's, it's like, oh boy, you know, here you are in the line. Well, you know, you, there you are in line, just go, well, who can I pray for in this line? You got me this line, Lord? I, I don't have to be mumbling and grumbling. I can do something positive. I can pray to the people this line. And it, it's amazing sometimes how you can be in that line, and then somebody comes in line behind you that needs to talk to you, needs to see you, needs to hear something that you have to say about the Lord. So many times it happens. And you go, oh. So now you can get in the line, you can have whatever, whatever the patience is in your life, and you can sit there and go, I don't know what God's going to do. And get joyful about it, right? Try it. Oh, I'm going to be joyful. Okay, where's the joy? You know, just work on it. <laughs> and verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Lord. Thanking Him for all these things that He desires for us in our life. Because He qualified us. He, you know, if you ever went out for sports and were a sport you had to qualify for, it, maybe a run or something, you had, to, you had to run in two minutes, you know, and you, if you ran in two minutes and ten seconds, you couldn't be in the race. And, and you had to and you got to qualify. Well, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like, okay, you got two minutes to finish this race, and you do it in two minutes and 30 seconds. So you didn't qualify, but Jesus comes along and says, I qualify you. You see, he qualifies us. When we're not qualified, he qualifies us. It's his blood shed on the cross that forgives us our sin, that we can be born again, that we can go to heaven. He qualified us. Thank you, Lord. He qualified you and I for heaven. It's his qualification, not mine. I didn't do it. I just said, yes, Lord, I believe. So be thankful. He did it all for us. The last two verses I want to look at, and we'll wrap it up here, is 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transformed, <coughs> transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Look what he has done for us. He has rescued you and I from hell, darkness. He rescued us and gives us eternity. Gives us light. Look at the world that is such a mess. He's rescued us out of the world. This is not our home any longer. Our home is the future, eternity. We're just passing through. And hopefully grabbing everybody we can. Let's go together, man. Let's go. We're going. We have a goal line. We're going to heaven. 
That's what he's done for us. He's rescued you and I. He took us out of it. He gives us something beautiful. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He says to you, to I, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's you. You're a royal priesthood. You're not only your Savior, you're a priest. Priest, one who ministers to the Lord, ministers to other people. You're a priest. You are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of the darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are a people of God. You have not you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's you, that's me, that's us. A royal priesthood. So he said, go out and share it. Tell others the good news. And so Paul prays for us. And one last time I want to read verse 9 of Colossians, chapter 1. Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that's His prayer for you and I. All we have to do is receive it, believe it, walk in it, walk in it in a manner worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in perfection, but in the Spirit, walking with Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for Your Word this morning, Your words of encouragement. Lord, thank You for reminding us, Lord, that we do need to pray for Your will in our lives and pray for for spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. Pray, Lord, that we can walk in the Spirit and walk in a manner that is worthy of You, Lord. And You can show us that, Lord, what that means for each one of us individually in this world. How do we do that in our lives? Lord, You teach us. You show us. Holy Spirit, You live in us. Lead us. Guide us. Bring us closer to You that we will know You more, Lord. More of You, Lord, in our lives. Because, Lord, you are good. You are gracious. You are full of mercy. You are a loving God. And you have loved us. So, Lord, we humble ourselves before you right now, Lord. We know nothing but you, Lord, and you crucified. Show us what you want of us. And be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song.
you and walk with Jesus, hang on.